How would a jet so big even lift off the ground? That's what people thought when the Boeing 747 was built. A giant in the sky, this was a jet that revolutionized aviation and made air travel accessible to people. Its engineering and design stand as stories of bold ideas that turned into legend. In the 1960s, the world was changing fast. Air travel was booming, but jets like the Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8 could only carry about 150 to 180 passengers. Pan Am's visionary CEO Juan Tripp saw an opportunity. He wanted to design a plane twice that size but keep ticket prices affordable to make air travel accessible to the masses. Boeing's answer was bold and risky at the same time. The company poured billions into a new aircraft program so expensive that it nearly bankrupted them if it failed. Chief Engineer Joe Sutter and his team of The Incredibles had just 28 months to design the 747 from scratch. The result would not only change Boeing's future but reshape aviation itself. At over 230 feet long and with a wingspan of 196 feet, the 747 was more than double the size of any contemporary jetliner. It introduced a wide-body, twin-aisle layout, making boarding faster and cabins more spacious. It was so revolutionary that Boeing had to build an entirely new factory in Everett, Washington, the largest building in the world by volume, just to assemble it. Airlines wondered if the jet was too big while airports scrambled to lengthen runways. But once the 747 took flight in 1969, it became clear that the world was ready for a new queen of the skies. Building the 747 required breakthroughs in almost every area of aviation engineering. Pratt & Whitney developed the JT-9D engine, which was the first high-bypass turbofan used on a wide-body aircraft. Each engine produced around 46,000 pounds of thrust. This was enough to lift a maximum takeoff weight of nearly 735,000 pounds. The wingspan of 196 feet had leading edge flaps, Kruger flaps, and massive trailing edge flaps to generate lift at slow speeds and allow the heavy jet to take off and land safely. The landing gear was another marvel. 18 wheels spread across four main bogies and a nose gear that distributed weight evenly and allowed the jet to operate from runways that weren't originally designed for such size. Inside the structure, engineers added multiple redundancies like triple hydraulic systems and reinforced fuselage sections. It was designed to be robust and reliable for flights lasting 10 to 14 hours. No other plane looks like the 747, and the reason is the hump just behind the nose. Originally, this was less of a style choice and more an engineering necessity. What airlines did with this extra space behind the cockpit was where magic happened. Pan Am and TWA turned it into glamorous lounges that had spiral staircases, piano bars, and fine dining. A seat upstairs meant luxury and signaled aviation's golden age. Over time, airlines swapped the lounges for business class seats, eventually creating the premium cabins we know today. Still, that ceiling and layout gave the upper deck a private jet feel. For frequent flyers, sitting upstairs on the hump became a bucket list experience. Before we move forward, let us ask you a question. Why did Boeing choose a hump instead of making the 747 a full double-deck jet from the start? Drop your guesses in the comments and we'll get back to this at the end of the video. From the very beginning, the 747's cabin set it apart from every other aircraft. Its twin-aisle wide-body layout was a first in aviation and created a sense of space that earlier jets couldn't match. The ceilings were higher, the aisles wider, and the rows stretched farther than passengers were used to. Boarding the jumbo jet felt like walking into a hotel lobby rather than an airplane. Airlines were quick to make use of this space. In the 1970s, upper deck lounges became icons of glamour. Downstairs, galleys the size of small restaurants prepared hundreds of meals for transoceanic flights. Over the years, the cabin evolved with technology. By the 1980s and 90s, airlines began installing personal entertainment systems, replacing shared movie screens with individual seatback monitors. Business class transformed into lie-flat seating while the quiet upper deck offered the most exclusive experience in the sky. Later, mood lighting and advanced air circulation systems gave the cabin a fresher, more modern feel. In its earliest years, the upper deck was an exclusive lounge. Airlines like Pan Am marketed it as a flying penthouse, complete with cocktails, chandeliers, and leather armchairs. As passenger demand grew, airlines converted the space to seating. By the 1990s, it became home to business class, featuring reclining sleeper seats and personalized service. 
The upstairs cabin's quiet atmosphere and unique layout made it highly desirable. For some travelers, flying upstairs on a 747 was more than just a seat, it was a rite of passage. Climb into the cockpit and the scale shifts again. Early 747s required a crew of three, captain, first officer, and flight engineer. The engineer monitors fuel and hydraulics on long-haul journeys. Rows upon rows of analog dials and switches filled the instrument panels. By the late 1980s, the 747-400 introduced a glass cockpit. Digital displays replaced most of the analog gauges, and the flight engineer's position disappeared. Now, only two pilots were needed to fly the jet. Yet, no matter the version, pilots say it felt like commanding a giant. From a cockpit 30 feet above the ground, they had a sweeping view of the runway. On takeoff, the 747 felt less like an airplane and more like piloting a moving city. For flights lasting up to 14 hours, the 747 had to take care of both passengers and crew. Cabin pressurization systems kept air breathable at altitudes above 35,000 feet. Oxygen masks were ready in case of emergencies. Climate control balanced temperatures across the huge interior and ensured comfort despite frigid conditions outside. Hidden above the main deck, crew rest areas gave pilots and flight attendants bunks for long journeys. In the galleys, ovens, refrigerators, and coffee makers kept thousands of meals flowing. All these features along with flight attendants kept the experience smooth and served hundreds of passengers with precision. Few jets were as adaptable as the 747. Over five decades, it evolved through multiple generations, the 74700, 200, 300, 400, and finally the 7478. Each variant introduced longer range and more efficient engines. Airlines upgraded interiors and reconfigured entertainment systems and seating. Cargo versions kept flying even as passenger fleets retired. The design's modularity ensured the jumbo remained relevant, even in a changing industry. This adaptability is why the last passenger 747 flew as late as 2023, over 50 years after its debut. The 747 moved the world with its massive capacity and reduced fares. Suddenly, families could cross oceans affordably and people could reach opportunities once out of reach. Airlines built their identities around it. Pan Am, British Airways, Singapore Airlines, Lufthansa, all became global icons in part because of their 747 fleets. The jet also served as a flying symbol of diplomacy. Air Force One turned the 747 into a presidential command center and inspired similar state aircraft worldwide. Freighter versions transformed trade. With a nose that swung open and a cavernous main deck, the 747 carried satellites, engines, racehorses, and relief supplies to disaster zones. It was as vital to global commerce as it was to passenger travel. When it entered service in 1970, the 747 instantly claimed the title of the world's largest passenger jet. It was the first commercial jet to cross the Pacific non-stop and set records for passenger loads, with some airlines squeezing over 600 people into a single flight. And its range of nearly 8,000 nautical miles allowed for journeys like New York to Hong Kong without stopping. The Jumbo also played starring roles in history. NASA used modified 747s to carry the space shuttle across the United States, creating one of the most iconic sites in aviation. Air Force One, a specially outfitted 747, became the Flying White House, carrying U.S. presidents on diplomatic missions across the globe. And in popular culture like Hollywood films and novels, the 747 became known for intercontinental travel. The Boeing 747 was a revolution in its own right. It shrank the world and became a symbol of human ambition in flight. Though production has ended, its legacy remains etched in aviation history. For millions, the queen of the skies will always be unforgettable. About that question earlier, the hump existed so the cockpit could sit above a nose that swung open for cargo loading, so the 747 could function both as a passenger jet and a freighter. If you enjoyed this journey inside the world's largest passenger jet, make sure to like the video, subscribe for more aviation stories, and share your own 747 memory in the comments below. It's heavier than a tank, bigger than a train car, and it's powerful enough to launch a fully loaded Boeing 777 into the sky for 15 hours non-stop. This isn't the work of any engine, it's the GE90, 
the largest and most powerful jet engine ever put on a passenger plane. And inside this giant monster are parts so delicate that a microscopic crack could bring it all down. The GE90 redefined long-haul flight when it first launched in 1995 with over 127,900 pounds of thrust and fan blades taller than an adult. Before it came along, transoceanic travel depended on four engine giants like the 747. But the GE90 made it possible for a twin-engine jet to fly routes beyond the Atlantic and the Pacific. This changed how airlines operated forever. The 777 became the backbone of long-haul fleets and the GE90 was the muscle that made it possible. But raw power wasn't going to cut it alone. Every inch of this engine had to be carefully designed because if even one part failed, the entire system could collapse. The front of the GE90 is impossible to miss. At over 128 inches across, it is wider than the fuselage of a Boeing 737. And yet, it only has 22 blades. Compare that to older engines, which had more than 40 or 50. But why design the engine to have fewer fans? Because these blades are bigger, lighter, and far more efficient. Each blade is made of carbon fiber composite with a titanium leading edge. They're built using a process called resin transfer molding, then cured in autoclave so large they could fit a bus inside. The shape isn't random either. They're curved into a distinctive scimitar design to not only grab more air, but also reduce noise. This is one reason the 777 is quieter than older jets, despite being much larger. And the wild part is that those blade tips travel at close to 1,000 miles per hour, just under the speed of sound. During testing, GE literally fired frozen turkeys into them to simulate bird strikes. The blades survived. Each blade costs more than a luxury car, and when you line up all 22 of them, they form the hypnotic spinning disc that feeds the rest of the engine. But once the air is pulled inside, things get even more extreme. Behind the fan lies the compressor, which takes air at normal pressure and squeezes it until it's 40 times denser. Imagine crushing a room full of air into a shoebox, and that's basically what's happening here. The GE90's compressor has three stages of low-pressure compression, followed by 10 stages of high-pressure compression. Each stage has blades shaped slightly differently and tuned to gradually build pressure without stalling the flow. The engine uses variable stator vanes that pivot in real time to optimize airflow at every speed and altitude. Over 1,200 kilograms of air per second rushes through the GE90. Each of the compressor blades is forged from nickel superalloys and inspected for cracks invisible to the human eye. Because even one blade failing under the enormous stress would have catastrophic effects. Before we move forward, here's a question for you. Why do you think the GE90's compressor uses concentric shafts that spin at different speeds instead of a single shaft for all stages? Let us know your guesses in the comments below, and we'll get back to it at the end of the video. The combustor is where air and fuel meet. It's an annular combustor in the shape of a ring, where 30 fuel nozzles spray atomized jet fuel into the compressed air. A tiny spark sets off a fireball at over 2,000 degrees Celsius, which is hot enough to melt most metals in seconds. So, how does it survive? With film cooling where thousands of microscopic holes line the walls of the combustor, a thin sheet of cooler air flows across the metal and creates a protective shield against the inferno inside. At its core, the flame burns at nearly 2,500 degrees Celsius, but by the time it reaches the turbines, it's cooled to about 1,500 degrees Celsius. That's still hotter than the melting point of steel. The turbines sit just behind the combustor and harvest energy from the rushing exhaust gases. They spin at over 10,000 revolutions per minute and glow red hot from the heat. But these blades aren't ordinary metal. Each one is grown from a single crystal of nickel alloy. No grain boundaries, no weak points. It's a material science breakthrough that allows them to survive temperatures and forces that would destroy almost anything else. They're hollow with air channels running through them to keep them cool. And they're coated in ceramic layers to withstand heat above 1,600 degrees Celsius. Even more impressive is that they're designed to twist slightly under stress, so they only reach their perfect aerodynamic shape when they're running in actual flight conditions. The design is genius. It's a blade that isn't perfect until it's on fire at 30,000 feet. Heat is the GE90's greatest enemy, and cooling is its hidden weapon. 
Inside, air is bled from the compressor and channeled into microscopic passages to stop the turbines and combustor from melting. The materials are chosen with precision, titanium in the fan and front sections for strength and weight savings, carbon fiber composites for the giant blades, nickel alloys and ceramics for the hot turbines. Even the bolts are matched to expand at the same rate as the metal they hold, so nothing cracks under stress. This quiet war against heat is what allows the GE90 to run for thousands of hours without failure. An engine this massive can't rely entirely on metal and fire. In fact, it has a brain. The GE90 is fully managed by Full Authority Digital Engine Control, or FADEC. Think of it as the autopilot for the engine itself. Instead of pilots manually adjusting throttle settings like in older jets, FADEC constantly monitors thousands of parameters every second for things like fuel flow and temperatures, and makes micro-adjustments faster than any human ever could. The result? Maximum thrust when you need it, and safer shutdowns if something goes wrong. It also means that every GE90 performs identically, no matter which 777 it's on. Airlines get consistency, passengers get reliability, and engineers get endless streams of data to predict issues before they happen. If you're enjoying the video so far, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And let us know in the comments what you find most fascinating about the GE90. We love hearing your thoughts. At GE's massive assembly plants, the GE90 comes together piece by piece. Cranes move modules the size of trucks into position. The engine is built in sections. Fan, compressor, combustor, turbines. Each module is tested individually before being joined to the whole. By the end, the engine stretches more than 24 feet long, weighs over 8 tons, and contains more moving parts than a Swiss watch. Only this watch doesn't tell time. It hurls a 300-ton plane across oceans. Then the GE90 undergoes rigorous testing. Engines like the GE90 are tortured before they ever see a plane. They're chained down and blasted at full power in test cells the size of hangars. The noise reaches over 140 decibels. For reference, that's louder than a rock concert. Massive underground ducts are used to absorb the roar so entire neighborhoods don't shake. Engineers simulate hail, freezing rain, sandstorms, even volcanic ash. They shoot birds and ice blocks into the fan. In one legendary test, GE deliberately broke a fan blade while the engine was at maximum thrust just to see what would happen. The engine tore itself apart but the debris stayed inside exactly as designed. Safety is never optional in aviation. The GE90 was about brute force and efficiency both. Its high bypass ratio meant that most air flowed around the core instead of through it. This makes it quieter and more fuel efficient. Its specific fuel consumption sits at around 0.52 pounds of fuel per pound of thrust per hour and that's remarkable for an engine of this size. Later upgrades brought 3D printed fuel nozzles, lighter materials and advanced sensors that beam real-time performance data to airlines mid-flight. And then came the next chapter, the GE9X for the 777X. Even larger, even lighter, with fan blades so thin they look impossible, it's already shaping the future of long-haul travel. The GE90 is proof of what humans can achieve when they push engineering to the edge. It reminds us how every leap in technology changes the way we travel and connect. And about that question from earlier. The GE90 uses two concentric shafts, so each compressor spins at its optimal speed, the low pressure slower, the high pressure faster, maximizing efficiency and preventing instability. If you enjoyed this deep dive into one of aviation's greatest machines, hit like and subscribe. Because the next story we uncover might be even bigger.